Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. I would like to start this talk by first thanking the organizers for inviting me to this workshop. It was my desire initially to visit Palermo, but because of many circumstances, it didn't happen. But I will visit Palermo at some time in the future. So let me motivate this talk by first talking about a binary switch for digital computing. Anytime you are doing any kind of digital hardware processing, all you're dealing with basically is a binary switch, which has two states on and off that encode the binary bit zero and one. And every time you do any kind of digital computation or information processing, you're toggling between these two states on and off to do the processing. The quintessential binary switch is, of course, the transistor, which has a lot of good qualities, but it has one bad quality. Being a charge-based device, it is volatile, and therefore it cannot retain information once it's powered on. And that causes some necessary evils, such as processor memory partition. So the volatile devices are in the process that they do the processing, and the instruction sets are stored in the memory. And every time one executes a computer program, one has to fetch data back and forth between the processor and memory, which slows up the computation and causes reliability issues and things like that. So people started talking about non-volatile binary switches. And the one that is most popular is, of course, a nanomagnetic switch. It is non-volatile. Therefore, it allows things like computing in memory, non von Neumann computing architectures, computers with no boot delay, etc. But there is a price to pay. And the price has to do with the excessive energy consumption or energy dissipation in a magnetic switch. So how much energy is dissipated in a magnetic switch actually depends on how you switch it. The obvious way to switch it would be with a magnetic field, but it takes a lot of energy to generate a magnetic field on chip with a current and the energy dissipation figures are typically one to 10 picojoules, which is huge. And then there are of course more modern techniques that require passing a spin polarized current to the magnet, such as spin transfer torque, spin orbit torque, et cetera. And they're also fairly dissipated. And then there is a voltage control mechanism, voltage control magnetic anisotropy, which is not current control like the others. It's more energy efficient, but it's still less energy efficient than a transistor. Modern day transistors dissipate about 100 attitudes of energy per switching event. And all of these mechanisms are much more dissipated than a transistor. So this is the price you pay for non-volatility. -vol it's a huge price to pay for non-volatility because you have a huge amount of energy dissipation. Energy actually is important today 10% of the energy generated in the United States is used for computation. That includes mainframes, desktops, laptops, iPods, uh, automotive, etc. In fact, big data centers today dissipate more energy than the city of Athens in Greece. And the carbon footprint and the pollution they create is comparable to that created by a nation like Malaysia. There was a request by an organization in Ukraine sometime back to build a data center for mining cryptocurrency data. And they wanted to build it right next to a nuclear power plant because they thought that the energy requirement would be two to three gigawatts. So energy is an important issue. And in addition to that, if you have small devices, you have to also reduce the energy dissipation. Because if you pack too many of these devices and you do not reduce the energy dissipation, your thermal management will fail. And so that causes problems for Moore's law. So energy is an important issue. So then the question that you will ask is, is there a nanomagnetic switch which is non-volatile and yet does not dissipate excessive amount of energy? And that there is one, that's Trentronics, which is the topic of this talk, Strangetronics is the science and technology of switching a magnetostrictive nanomagnets magnetization with electrically generated mechanical strain. And it's extremely energy efficient, one to two orders of magnitude less energy dissipation than a transistor. 
But of course, you will ask, is there also a price to pay with strange robots? And there is one, but I will talk about that later. So let me tell you first what Strangetronics switching is, how it is done. So you have a nano magnet shaped like an elliptical disc and its magnetization has two stable directions along the major axis of the ellipse, either pointing to the right or to the left. And these two encode the binary bits zero and one. So when you switch the magnet, you will flip the magnetization from right to left or left to right. The way you do this is you place the magnet on top of a piezoelectric film so that the magnet is in elastic contact with the piezoelectric film. And you delineate two gate paths, which are shorted together. The piezoelectric film is pulled in one direction. And if you apply a gate voltage such that the electric film is anti-parallel to the direction of pulling, then you will generate compressive stress along the major axis of the ellipse and tensile stress along the minor axis of the ellipse. And if you reverse the polarity, you will do the opposite. You will change the signs of the stresses. Now, the magnet is made of a magnet restrictive material and the magnet restriction can be positive or negative. For example, if you use tarpanol D or galphenol, the magnet restriction is positive. If you use cobalt or nickel, the magnet restriction is negative. And the stress also has a sign, tensile stress is positive, compressive stress is negative. And as long as the product of the magnet restriction and the stress is negative, what will happen is that if you apply the gate voltage, the magnetization will rotate by 90 degrees and align along the minor axis of the loops. And then if you withdraw the stress, as soon as the 90 degree rotation is completed, there is an inertial torque that acts on the magnetization that will make it rotate by an additional 90 degrees and make it flip. So you do a 180 degree rotation. But you have to pulse the stress correctly. If you overshoot or you undershoot, it will not work. So your stress pulse has to be timed correctly. What is the advantage of this? Well, the advantage is that you can switch fairly fast in less than one nanosecond. So switching delay here goes from 0.7 to about 0.3 nanoseconds. And the amount of voltage that you need to switch in that duration, in that amount of time, is plotted here on top. You can see that it's tens of millivolts. So the energy dissipation is extremely small. And if you actually plot the total energy dissipation, you can see that it's a few hundred kTs at room temperature. So in other words, the amount of energy that you dissipate is actually slightly less than one attojoule if you use a material with high magnet restriction like tarpanology. Now, of course, there is one disadvantage. You have to pulse correctly, pulse the stress correctly. If you overshoot or undershoot, it will not work. So you can say that I, I don't want to do that. That's too much for me. Is there another way? And there is another way where you don't have to time the pulse correctly. And that is, if you have a configuration like this, here's the magnet and you have four contact paths and the two antipodal contact paths are shorted together. You first activate this pair that makes the magnetization rotate to an acute angle. Then you activate the other one that makes it rotate to an additional acute angle and then let go of all of them and the magnetization flips. So, this does not require precisely timing the pulse, but of course the price to pay is you have a larger area because now you have four contact pairs. So the theory of this is, was in this publication in Applied Physics Letters, and the experimental demonstration of this paradigm was in this narrow letters paper. So the first thing we did was we wanted to do something useful with Strangetronics, so we wanted to implement a NOT gate or an inverter. And the way you do that is with two nanomagnets. One is more shaped and isotropic or elliptical than the other. And the magnetization states in these two nanomagnets encode the input bit and the output bit. So this is the input and that's the output. Okay. If you place the two magnets in this fashion, such that the line joining the centers is parallel to the minor axis, then dipole coupling will make the magnetizations in the two nanomagnets mutually anti-parallel. So if this is the input bit and that's the output bit, the output is the logic complement of the input. And so you have an inverter or not gate. 
But well, now let's say that I flip the input there. So I push this up, which I can do with the global magnetic field, which will magnetize both of them in the up direction. And then I remove the magnetic field. You will think that dipole interaction should make this magnetization now flip down to assume the anti-parallel configuration, but it does not happen. It does not happen because in order to do that, the magnetization has to overcome the shape and isotropy energy barrier in this magnet. And typically dipole coupling is not strong enough to beat the shape and isotropy energy barrier. So it doesn't get, it gets stuck in this very stable state and it doesn't flip. So what we do is we apply global stress. Global stress does not affect this magnet because it is too shape and isotropic energy barrier is extremely high but it does affect the output nanomagnet. Its energy barrier is much lower. So its magnetization rotates by 90 degrees and points along the minor axis. Then you let go of the stress. And now this magnetization has two options. It can either flip back up, which would be the wrong thing to do, or it can flip down, which would be the right thing to do for a knot gate. And because of dipole coupling, there is a preference for it to flip down. So it will flip down with more than 50% probability as a result of the dipole coupling. So this would implement a knot gate with more than 50% probability. So we actually fabricated this structure with uh, EBM lithography. And so this is the input magnet, which has dimensions of 200 nanometers, major axis, 80 nanometer, minor axis. This is the output nanomagnet, 200 nanometer, major axis, 130 nanometer minor axis. And then we took a magnetic field and we magnetized both in the up direction. So this is the magnetic force micrograph image. If you're not familiar with MFM images, think of the light areas as the north pole of the magnet and the dark areas as the south pole. So these are all, these all we have nine pairs here and they're all magnetized up. So all of the magnetizations are pointing in the up direction. Then we remove the magnetic field, we apply stress, and we remove the stress, and we expect that more than 50% would flip. More than 50% of these pairs would flip. But in reality, only one out of nine flips. So the probability of working is nowhere near 50%, it's only about 12%. So the error probability is actually 88%. Why so high? So we thought that maybe one of the reasons is we used cobalt nanomagnets. Cobalt is not very magnetostrictive. Its magnetostriction is only about 60 parts per million. So we replaced cobalt with a much more magnetostrictive material, which is galphenol, iron gallium. This one has a magnetostriction of 300 ppm, five times higher than cobalt. And we repeated the experiment and sure enough, our statistics improved. Now one out of four flipped but it's still only 25%, not 50% success probability. The error probability is 75%. But there's a good thing. We can measure the capacitance and we can measure the voltage applied across the entire substrate. So we get the CV squared, then we amortize that among the different pairs and we find that the energy dissipation per pair, CV squared dissipation is only about three to four attojoules. So it's extremely low the energy dissipation is very, very low. But the price that we have paid is the high error probability. So this is the price you pay for strain tronics. I said there is no such thing as a free launch. You have to pay a price. And this is the price you pay for strain tronics. If you have highly energy efficient switching mechanisms, it's also error proof. And this is an unavoidable trade-off between energy efficiency and reliability. This is true of not just magnetic switches, but also electronic and even optical switches. And we actually analyzed electronic, magnetic and optical switches. And we showed in this particular paper that there is always this trade off between reliability and energy efficiency. If you're in the device community, you probably are familiar with the practice of benchmarking switches. This, there's actually an industry that does this kind of thing. And the benchmarking is based only on the energy delay product. The lower the energy delay product, the better is the switch. But this is not a right thing to do because it does not take into account the reliability issue. You can always buy lower energy delay product at the cost of reliability. So 
This is not a good practice of benchmarking, which is only on the basis of their energy to their product. Now, in the case of strain tronics, where does the switching error come from? High switching error, where does it come from? There are two sources, structural defects and thermal noise. So if you look at the, mag the magnets that are fabricated in our lab, we are an academic lab, so we fabricate nanomagnets with EVM lithography followed by development of the resist, then metal evaporation and lift up. And if you look at the surfaces, this is an AFM of the surface. You can see that the surface is fairly rough and the edges are also fairly rough. And this roughness is actually deadly. It causes a lot of errors, switching errors. And then of course, there's also thermal noise that can also scuttle the switching and adds to the switching error probability. So we actually simulated this to see how much the structural errors give rise to switching error probability. So we studied defects like a hole in the middle or if there's a hill in the middle, or there's a thickness variation or rim, et cetera. And we found that we did micromagnetic simulations with Numax. This is in this paper here. And we found that the error probabilities can be as large as a few percent at room temperature if you have defects like this. The defects really exacerbate, uh, exacerbate the switching error probabilities. <clears throat> now, if that's the case, then you cannot do Boolean logic with strain tronics because Boolean logic has stringent error requirements. Typically, the error probability should be less than 10 to the negative 15. That's a very, very stringent error requirement. The reason is that in Boolean logic, error is contagious. If you have one logic gate that produces a corrupted output and that output is fed as input to the next gate, then the next gate's output is also corrupted and so on and so forth, so error propagates. And that is why you cannot do dynamic error correction on a logic chip. And as a result, the requirement for error probability is very stringent in the negative 15. You will never be able to reach that with strain tronics. So then what is strain tronics good for? Well, obviously it's good for non-Boolean computing, such as neuromorphic, probabilistic, Bayesian inference engines, et cetera. These computing paradigms are forgiving of high error rate because most of them, in fact, almost all of them are based on what are called collective computational models, where it is the collective activity of many devices working cooperatively in unison that elicits the computational activity and the failure of one or even a few devices do not really impair the circuit functionality. We actually did a simulation one time, uh, not with magnetic devices, but with nanowires and a neuromorphic network. And we found that the functionality is not destroyed even if 30% of the devices fail. So these are extremely forgiving of errors. And so this is one area where strain tronics would probably find a niche. And there are other things, I'm gonna talk about a cliche now. So this is something that you're all familiar with. This is a picture of Gary Kasparov playing chess with IBM's deep blue computer. Gary lost barely, but his brain dissipated 20 watts of energy, whereas deep blue dissipated several kilowatts of energy. So the human brain is extremely energy efficient, much more energy efficient than any digital computer. And and in some tasks, you know this, that in some tasks like face recognition, the human brain is far, far superior to even the best digital computer that there is. Okay. So neuromorphic computing would be one playground for strain tronics. We actually design a very simple, the simplest threshold neuron with a strain tronic magnetotunneling junction, but this one, is what we call a skewed strain tronic magnetotunneling junction. Skewed because the easy axis or the major axis of the hard layer and the major axis of the soft layer are not collinear. They have an angle between them. So that's the requirement. And with this, we showed that we can generate a threshold firing neuron. And this resistors are the synaptic weights. And we, we actually uh, simulated the firing of this neuron with stochastic landau lipschitz gilbert equation simulations. And this is the firing characteristic. You can see that there is some dispersion here because of thermal noise. This is the strain tronic magnetic tunneling junction based neuron. 
<clears throat> now, there's a group in Purdue University that also did essentially the same thing, but they used STT. And you can see that this is their firing characteristic, a little more noisy than ours. But more importantly, our energy dissipation is only about eight attojoules. But if you use Traintronic, in their case, the energy dissipation for the firing was 50 femtojoules, so more than 1,000 times larger. And our firing delay was slightly less than one nanosecond, so this is about six nanoseconds. So this is one area where Strainetronics can have a tremendous amount of advantage in giving you an extremely energy efficient neuron. We can also do things like elementary arithmetic with Strainetronic magnetic charging. This idea has actually came out of one of my collaborators, Professor Andres Moritz from University of Massachusetts. So let me just explain how a multiplier works. Okay. So if you look at this simple voltage divider circuit, the current flowing through this resistor I out would be V into divided by R MTJ, the resistance of the MTJ plus this series resistance. But this series resistance, it's much smaller than the MTJ resistance. So you can neglect this and you can write I out is equal to V into divided by R MTJ. Now, if the RMTJ is switched to its train, and we've calculated this, this is the switching characteristic going from the high resistance anti-parallel state to the low resistance parallel state. There's a region in between where this curve is hyperbolic, meaning that the RMTJ is inversely proportional to the strain voltage. So the strain voltage is V in one, RMTJ is inversely proportional to V in one, so you can write this I out as being proportional to the product of V in two and V in one. So this is the multiplier. The current is the product of the two voltages or the voltage drop over this resistor is proportional to the product of these two voltages. Of course, you have to bias this in the right region. And so this is, this is the simplest version, easy to explain with this, but the actual device kind of looks like this, where you have a bias voltage and things like that. We simulated this and we found that indeed it works like a multiplier. So you can get a multiplier with a single MTJ. Whereas if you wanted to do this, if you try to do this with transistors, you would need four transistors. So this is a device with an extremely small footprint. Now I'm going to talk about another one, which is even smaller in footprint. This is a ternary content addressable memory. So here you do not address the memory by its address, but you address it by its content, such as where it stores a bit stream 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, et cetera. So the way this works is you have, uh, again, a skewed magnetotunneling junction where the major axis of the hard layer shown in dark blue and the major axis of soft layer shown in light blue they're not collinear, they have an angle between them. And because this is the easy axis, the, the hard layer, by the way, is magnetized permanently along the direction of the black arrow. And the soft layer's magnetization would prefer to align itself in the up direction along the major axis. That is because there's some dipole coupling between the hard layer and soft layer. And dipole coupling would like to make them anti-parallel. So the angle between them would be obtuse. It will not be acute. The magnetization will point up, not down to make the angle between them obtuse. Now, when you apply strain to the soft layer, the magnetization begins to rotate away from the easy axis towards the hard axis, but it will rotate clockwise. That's important. It will rotate clockwise, never anti-clockwise because of dipole interaction, which likes to make these two magnetizations remain as anti-parallel as possible. So when it starts rotating and it rotates clockwise, at some point, the red arrow would align anti-parallel to the black arrow. And so the two layers of anti-parallel magnetization and the resistance is highest and the current is lowest and that's this notch. So as you vary the voltage that makes this magnetization, the red arrow rotate, you will reach a notch, and then as you go past that anti-parallel, the resistance will decrease and the current will go back up, and you will get this notch type characteristic. In the transfer characteristic, current through the MTJ plotted here versus the voltage applied here to cause the strain. Okay, 
Now, you can actually move the position of this notch around, you can shift it around by applying a third voltage V3 here. So the V3 will make the notch position shift around. And in fact, the notch occurs in V3 is equal to V2 plus a fixed voltage Vm. This can implement a ternary content addressable memory. So the way this happens is you have this Traintronic magnetotronic junction and two MTJs. The two MTJs actually store the bits. And what you do is in the content addressable memory, you have a search bit and you have a store bit and you see if the two bits match. And if the two bits match, you found the address. Okay, so the search bit is encoded in V2 and the stored bit in V3. And whenever the current is high, you have a match. And then if the current is low, you have a mismatch. I don't really have the time to go through this because it's fairly complicated, but it's in all in this paper here. But what I would like to point out is that to make this ternary content addressable memory, you just needed one strain tronic memory, uh, one strain tronic MTJ and two normal MTJs. Whereas if you wanted to do this with transistors, you would need 16, one six, 16 transistors. So this can reduce footprint by a lot. To All right. The next thing I want to talk about is probabilistic computing. So here, what we have is a combinational switching mechanism. We have a magnet, um, MTJ, a magnetotron link junction, which is switched with VCMA, voltage control magnetic anisotropy. But VCMA switching usually requires an in-plane in magnetic field. What we do is we don't use an in-plane magnetic field, but we use stress. Stress acts like an effective magnetic field, so it can act like that in-plane magnetic field. So we have a combination of VCMA and stress here. And the advantage is that this is an all electric switching scheme with no magnetic field involved. And if you vary the VCMA voltage, then we can switch the magnetic tunneling junction with different probabilities. So here we have plotted about 1000 switching trajectories. Some of them switch, go from one to zero, and some of them do not switch, go back to one. And so the probability of switching is the fraction of the trajectories that switched we can plot the probability versus the VCMA voltage, and we get the very well-known hyperbolic tangent kind of curve over here. So we use this as an image classifier in a restricted Boltzmann machine. The test, of, so there are two layers. There's a visible layer and a hidden layer, and there is no intra-layer connection, so each layer can be updated simultaneously. There is only inter-layer connection, which is the hallmark of restricted Boltzmann machines. So we have a, the test of training sets are applied to the visible layer and the hidden layer does feature extraction. So in a, this is a stochastic neural network and this activation function produces a zero or one with the probability determined by network weights and the applied pattern. So applied pattern is encoded in the VCMA voltage. A single MTJ can implement the activation function in a restricted Boltzmann machine since it can generate control probabilities. So we use this to do the simplest task that everybody does, MNIST handwritten digit recognition. So we have a 26 by 26 pixel image here. This is the handwritten digit eight, and we can recognize the digit eight or any other digit for that matter with 99.8% probability using this paradigm. The weights are actually implemented with memristors and the activation function is implemented with this strain tronic magnetic tunneling junction. The image classification task can be done, at, we simulated this, can be done at 166 megahertz, and the energy dissipated is about 135 microwatts. Most of this comes from the memristor, not from the MTJ. And you can, if you can replace the memristor synapses with something more energy efficient, this can come down by one to two or even three orders of magnitude. So this is. This, all of this is, I don't really have, even have time to go through all the details, but this is in this paper that you can look at. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna quickly talk about is image processing. So here we have a magnet and we apply a magnetic field in this direction along the minor axis, which brings the two stable magnetization orientations out of the easy axis and makes them subtend an angle of 90 degrees between them. And these two or magnetic orientations encode pixel colors, black and white. You can write pixel colors by converting brightness to a voltage 
with a photo detector, then using a level shifter so that positive voltage is white and negative voltage is black or vice versa. And then you can apply positive and negative voltage to align the magnetization along these two directions and map the pixels into the nanomagnet states. So this is one example of image processing. Say you have an image with a light or white region and a black region here. And noise corrupted the image and made it a random patch of black and white pixels. This is what happens when an image gets blurred. The sharp boundary between the light area of the image and the dark area of the image gets blurred. And so this is that. Now, if you apply stress to it, so we simulated this, we apply stress to it and let go, dipole coupling between the neighbors does some. What it does is the following. A black pixel will turn white if its majority neighbors are white, and a white pixel will turn black if its majority neighbors are black. This is classic low pass filtering action. And it gives rise to this. So the, the majority white region becomes all white and the majority black, black region becomes all black. This is called edge enhancement detection. The advantage is that it's massively parallel hardware based. There's no software involved and therefore it's extremely fast. And the image processing time is almost independent of pixel size. It's extremely fast image processing. The next thing I want to talk about quickly is ground state computing. This is well known. So what people do in ground state computing is that they will map a computational problem into a system of interacting elements, where the ground state configuration of these interacting elements would represent the optimal solution to the problem. The, the, the issue with this technique, this is done for computer vision, many other things. The issue with this technique is that you may not get the optimal solution and you will not get it if the system does not reach the ground state. And sometimes it can get stuck in a metastable state. And if it gets, gets stuck in a metastable state and cannot get out of that state, then you are not going to reach the optimum solution. So this is a well-known problem in computer science where people do something called simulated NEM, which is a computational algorithm that will drive a system stuck in a metastable state into the ground state. So we will talk about a hardware analog of this simulated NEM. So what we did was we fabricated arrays of nanomagnets. This is an AFM image of this nanomagnets. Not all of them have good magnetic contrast, but we isolated a section of three by three nanomagnets, which have excellent magnetic contrast. And we calculated the ground state configuration of this three by three array. And it's obvious what the ground state configuration would be. Because of dipole interaction between the nanomagnets, what happens is, that you have ferromagnetic ordering along a column and antiferromagnetic ordering along a row. So either this or that would be the two ground states. These are degenerate ground states. Now there are nine magnets, each one can have two states up and down. So there are two to the power nine or 512 possible combinations. And we calculated the ground states of all of these combinations using electromagnetic simulations. And sure enough, there are two degenerate ground states that correspond to these two, all right? So we actually took this nanomagnet and we let it relax to the ground state and we did an MFM. And you can see this is uh, the MFM of the ground state configuration. You can see that you have south pole, north pole, dark area, south pole, light area, north pole, south, north, south, north, south, north. This is ferromagnetic ordering along the column. And along the row, you have antiferromagnetic. So this is south and this is north. Okay. So then we took a high moment MFM tip and we messed up the ordering, the ground state ordering. And it got stuck in the metastable state where you can see that the MFM is looking like this. And then we apply a time varying stress or a surface acoustic wave which restores the metastable state back to the ground state. So we recover the ground state. So here, the surface acoustic wave actually acts like a simulated NEM, which is a very important function in ground state-based computing. We can do that with Straintronics. In this case, Straintronics is done not with a static strain, but with a time-varying strain. Okay. 
hardware-based simulator than that. The last thing I want to talk about is a correlator and an anti-correlator. So this is important in many things. Uh, it is important in Boltzmann machines, and it is also extremely important in two-node Bayesian networks. Now, Bayesian networks are a little more difficult to implement than Boltzmann machines. The reason is that in the Boltzmann machine, the synaptic weight matrix is symmetric. But in a Bayesian network, it's asymmetric because you have a parent node and a child node, and the relationship between the parent and child is not reciprocal. So you need a non-reciprocal synaptic weight. One way to do that <coughs> is to have two magnetic tunneling junctions. One is a parent node, another is a child node. The parent node is more shape and isotropic, more elliptical than the child node, which is less elliptical. You don't see that in this figure, but it is. And then you apply global stress. Global stress does not affect the parent because it's too shape and isotropic, but it affects the child node. And what the global stress does is it varies the energy barrier inside the soft layer of the child node, soft layer of this MTJ. And that allows the dipole influence of the parent node to determine the magnetization state of the soft layer and therefore the resistance state of the MTJ. So the way this works is if you, this is the, the green one here, is the energy barrier within the soft layer of the child node here. It is asymmetric because of dipole interaction. So there is a metastable state and there is a ground state. And say so the system is stuck in the metastable state. Now you depress this energy barrier with the stress that you apply here. You can actually over depress it and invert the energy barrier with excessive stress. <clears throat> but as you depress the energy barrier, you can make the ball, this yellow ball, representing the current state, slide over to the ground state. So if you slide over to the ground state, you come here, then of course the two magnetization states in the soft layer of the parent node and the soft layer of the child node, they'll be mutually anti-parallel. So that's anti-correlation. And if you're if you're in a high barrier state, you don't slide over. So you stay where you are and then you are correlated. So you can vary the degree of correlation by varying the stress. We simulated this, and of course, you can go from no correlation to perfect 100% anti-correlation. You can see that in this one, there is, you uh, see this for very close, uh, the separation between the two is 150 nanometers. This is slightly more 250 nanometers. You see a distinct notch here, and that corresponds to this one, where you have just eroded the barrier, but not over eroded it. If you over eroded it, the ball will first go here and then here. That's the two step process, and the probability of successful transition is less than if you have just this. So that is why this node here corresponds to this number three, where you have just eroded the barrier. So these kinds of things, major networks are used for various things, computing the presence of uncertainty, for example, disease progression with stock market behavior. But one of the things it is good at is if you have a number of causes that give rise to an outcome, it can identify what is the most probable cause. So in this case, we actually did one example like that and we showed that we can do that. We can identify the most likely cause of something uh, using this parent and child load implemented with the magnetic tunneling junction network. This is a very complicated business, and I don't have time to go into this, but this is the paper where you can find this description here. So in summary, strangetronic nanomagnetic devices are extremely energy efficient, but of course the price to pay is the high error rate. It's error prone, not error resilient. So it's not suitable for Boolean logic because of poor error resilience, but it is very suitable for a number of non-Boolean computing paradigms, such as analog computing, uh, neural networks, uh, probability computing, Boltzmann machines, computer vision, image processing, Bayesian inference engines, Isaac machines, and uh, combinatorial optimization inference, etc. So this is where strange objects can play a very major role in non-Boolean, unconventional computing. So with this, I'll stop, and I would like to acknowledge my collaborators.
uh, Amit Ranjan Trivedi from University of Illinois, Chicago, Jaisal Tulasima from my university, Professor Anjan Barman from the, the Satyendra uh, SM Bose National Center for Basic Sciences in Kolkata, India, and Professor Saba Andres Morris from University of Massachusetts at Amherst. These are the students who worked on this over the last few years. And I'm currently supported by NSF and an Indo-US Science and Technology Fund. And with that, I will stop and thank you for your attention.